Hello, my name is Paul Swain and I am the officer of Mole Salvation Army, so welcome to you. In my last sermon, I spoke vividly about the message and sign of the rainbow and the ark that they indisputably revealed Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ, to us, explaining that salvation message focusing on light and revelation. Then God also gave me a dream in which he revealed a shaking in the world, which was quickening the division between those who heed the calling of the Lord and those who forsake it. At the end of the dream, it, its comprehension was magnified with the powerful image and statement as it was in the days of Noah. So it is that with any important message for our direction, that there will be an element of carrot and stick, or rather consequence. And there is no more important message to any of us than the very salvation of our eternal soul. So these words, as it was in the days of Noah, have by warning a compelling gravity. Therefore, I would like to begin today with the context and read for you from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 36 through to 51. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then? is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master when he comes will find so doing. Assuredly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and to drink with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, at an hour that he is not aware of, and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Through the entirety of Matthew 24, Jesus explains vividly and comprehensively signs of the times, from the destruction of the second temple in Jerusalem up to his own return coming on the clouds with glory. Yet, we here today still await Jesus' return his second coming. Therefore, how can we relax and not be convicted to study this text? Indeed, are Jesus' words not a warning to us? Not only is Jesus warning us to get ready and to shape up, but he amplifies that message with three shocking illustrations in the next chapter. The parable of the wise and foolish virgins, the parable of the talents, 
and a revelation of the son's judgment between sheep and goats. I encourage you to read and to understand both chapters 24 and 25, recognising them as being one whole speech and lesson of Jesus to us. To underline this idea, I further submit Luke's Gospel from chapter 17 verse 20 through to chapter 18 verse 14, that it covers the same statements about the end days, that the days of Jesus Christ's return are as like the days of Noah. Here also in Luke's Gospel it is followed up with further illustrations much the same and in like context as we have already just read in Matthew's Gospel. Interestingly in Luke 17 verse 20 the account actually begins with the Pharisees seeking a sign of the coming kingdom. When the Pharisees asked Jesus to show them a sign from heaven even earlier in Matthew 16 verse 1 to 4 Jesus replied that the signs were all around and questioned as to how they could not see the signs of the times. Here Jesus finished by saying, A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. It marks my mind that this same questioning of the Pharisees still dogs the people of God today to prove themselves into others' unbelief. And I guess the answer is just the same. Let our words and actions judge us, as they judge all, for by their fruit they are known. That our Master so answering, that Jesus Christ lay dead, planted in the ground to arise the first fruits amongst us, his actions fulfilling his very word. But the point I really want to make here was that Jesus also gave them the sign of the prophet Jonah for their own generation. And indeed that generation witnessed the very moment of its fulfilment in their own time. Against this realisation, I find that it is imperative for us to understand the signs of our own time. 2,000 years ago, Jesus illustrated the sign of his first coming with the sign of the prophet Jonah. He also illustrated the sign of his second coming with the sign of Noah, who I would also call a prophet. For Peter, in 2 Peter 2 verse 5, calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. And I say of that, that if Peter calls Noah a preacher, then did he not also prophesy? For what else can we call building a giant ark but a prophetic witness in the world of the coming judgment and salvation? In Matthew 24 and in Luke 17, Jesus speaks prophetically from the time in which he was speaking up till the time of his return. And in both accounts he gives us the sign of Noah for those latter days. So today, when I see parades of people with flags of a rainbow and windows of houses covered in rainbows and God gives me a dream in which the people are separated and it ends with the words, as in the days of Noah, and sharing this dream, I hear many others, many believers saying that the same words came to them as in the days of Noah? How can we not stare? How can we still be asleep? Yes, a sleeping or blind generation may say, prove it, show us a sign. 
In Matthew 16, Jesus explained that the signs were all around, but that the wicked did not see or recognise them. Yet in Matthew 24, verse 42 to 44, Jesus implores us to watch and to be ready, encouraging us that doing so, we will not be overtaken by surprise. The thing is, Jesus wants us to jolt up, awake now, rather than to be hopelessly surprised at the end of time when it is far too late. This is why he emphasised the story with so many grave and urgent illustrations. The fact is that I believe when Jesus said that two will be in a field, one taken, one left, two will be grinding, one taken, one left, that I believe Jesus was actually explaining the division of followers, good followers separated from the bad followers, rather than it simply being the illustration of the saved, separated out from what we might imagine to be the obvious lost souls of the world. Indeed, Matthew 24 ends with the overt illustration of a good and bad servant. But nonetheless, both were known as servants. Then, through the illustration that followed of the wise and foolish virgins, we see that both groups pledged themselves to the Lord for marriage, but only the chosen had stayed alight, being full of the oil of the Holy Spirit. The illustration of the talents was again of servants and not complete strangers the talents being both the word and the spirit. But again, the bad servant would have nothing to do with it, keeping what was given buried in the earth and separate from himself. The illustration of the sheep and goat showed that both were considered to be flocks, one being faithful and domesticated and the other wild and willful. Jesus meant this as a warning to stir up his followers into life. It is meant to shock us. And if you are not stirred or shocked by it, then perhaps you are either asleep or dulled, being long resistant to the calling. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 45, Jesus asks, Who then is a faithful and wise servant? And in Luke chapter 18, verse 8, he asks, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? As a follower of Jesus Christ, I love to talk about God and the scriptures with Jesus flowing all of the way through everything. I really love it and it excites me so that when I get to talk with others of such things, then I lose track of all time. Well, who wants to quit a party when they are having fun? My wife has done some great teaching on joy recently. On the joy of the Lord being our strength. And I say that this joy of the Lord is the knowledge of the Lord. And of the privilege it is to know him and to be known. The inexpressible joy as when one is lost in worship, totally focused and connected with God, how that overflowing joy leads us to, into a silence, in awe at the love, grace and mercy of God. I remember a time many years ago, where I was so lost in praise and worship, that I could have, without exaggeration, stayed in that moment forever. I remember it so vividly because God was taking me into a whole new level of faith in that it was like heaven had truly come down to earth and if Jesus himself had visibly appeared, I wouldn't have battered an eyelid. Right after that euphoria of realising and experiencing the truth of it all, I was hit by a shocking thought. The thought that I had not till then been taking it seriously enough. That our time, this time was so brief, 
so that the one regret when he really does come back would be that we didn't do more that I didn't do more all of my life as a Christian save for the few times I have faltered I have been looking forward to the Lord's return in fact I cannot think of a better proof of our readiness than of our desire for his return Luke 21 verse 28 now when these things begin to happen look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near lift up your heads almost sounds as if the church of saints had become downcast and sorrowful doesn't it i wonder will the church as the world dictates to it continue to grow silent will the singing and joyful scripture sharing all end or will those embers instead remember the lord repentantly so fanning into flame again how has satan tricked us to silence the gospel of jesus christ calling it manners at what point did pilgrims leave the path to picnic and to idle with other games and distraction when did the cross of christ become irrelevant and who would even dare to say such a thing and who then would spread that message calling it peace the cross always will be a place of direction and division forever a place of choosing as it was in the days of noah wooden beams form into an ark what do we think noah did and what were those times like noah was faithful to god he stuck with the vision and the plan even though it took a very long time to build he never amended or altered god's design despite its grand scale at any point he could have just given up and used those beams of wood to create a palace for himself or taken all of those animals for his own noah was faithful despite the fact that to all of us and his peers his vision might have sounded foolish and all his labor seemed desperately irrelevant in fact other than his family noah was indeed alone in his labor when his neighbors passed by or inquired would noah not have preached and prophesied to them pleaded for them pitied them then the fateful day came that the door was closed up and sealed with pitch and fastens so that it could not be opened again until after the flood had passed away there there is a sight and sound that haunts me whenever i think of that time the apostle paul also spoke of such a time of the latter days ahead describing them in his letter to timothy in 2 timothy 3 verse 1 to 7 but what stands out to me is verse 5 and 7 where paul describes a tragedy within the lost as having a form of godliness but denying its power and always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth this haunts me because paul is explaining how they do not know god for god is the power just as god is the source of all goodness and truth that they were neither knowing god nor being known by him is this what jesus was describing in matthew 7 verse 21 not all who say lord lord some things are meant to haunt us some things are meant to warn true visions must be fulfilled 
arks built and people ready. Revelation 3 verse 19 to 22. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Friends, Jesus is the banner of our protection. He is the rainbow light by which we see. He is the ark of our salvation in which we must abide. Friends, if you hear his voice today and there is still time to enter the ark, then let it be today your day of salvation. Seek him while you still can, for the knowledge of the Lord is joy everlasting. Church, if you are not excited to see Jesus return, then repent and remember that we have one bold gospel just one truth to tell john 3 verse 16 to 18 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus Christ, Yeshua Messiah, is the final ark. He is the only boat, the only lifeboat, the only way. If you hear his voice today, do not delay. God bless you and peace to you, the only peace in Christ our Lord. Amen.